Hi everyone, thanks for tuning in. My name is Ranger Ryan and I'm a staff member here at the Fredericksburg and Spotsylvania National Military Park. As we continue our discussion on the Battle of Fredericksburg, we talk about people like Robert E. Lee and Ambrose Burnside. And we talk about places like Maurice Heights and Prospect Hill. But what sometimes we overlook are the people of the city of Fredericksburg and what they lived through in the days of December 1862. So over the next few minutes, what I'd like to do is talk about those people and talk about some of their experiences and what they wrote about and remembered after the war. And so we talk about the city of Fredericksburg. The city itself is incorporated in 1728, and 130 years later, the city had grown to almost 5,000 people. That city relied on the river traffic of the Rappahannock River and of the railroad traffic of the Richmond, Fredericksburg, and Potomac Railroad. The, the city itself had gas lighting, some houses had plumbing, but that success came to a screeching halt with the outbreak of the Civil War. President, uh, Confederate President Jefferson Davis said Fredericksburg is right in the wrong spot because we're equally distant, 50 miles to the north is Washington and 50 miles to the south is, is Richmond. And so because of that geographic center of operations, both armies are going to spend the war crisscrossing this territory. The city itself changes hands seven times during the Civil War. And through late 1861 into early 1862, when the Union Army first comes here in April 1862, those transitions are largely bloodless. There's not very much fighting to speak of. Uh, when the Union Army was here from April to August 1862, it was a relatively quiet time here. That changes in the winter of 1862. The United States Army of the Potomac arrives here on November 17th, 1862, coming here to Stafford and looking out over Stafford Heights at Fredericksburg across the Rappahannock River. But they can't get across. They don't have any pontoon boats. Uh, bridging material had been destroyed when the previous armies had changed hands. And so the army has to wait for pontoon boats to arrive. The city is demanded uh, of Union officials to be surrendered, but can, uh, Mayor of Fredericksburg Montgomery Slaughter refuses that, but also promises that Fredericksburg would not be used militarily by Confederate forces. However, that's not Montgomery Slaughter's call to make. And so when Robert E. Lee's Army of Northern Virginia arrives here, of course Confederates are going to move into Fredericksburg and begin to make defensive plans to fight in the streets of Fredericksburg. And so we think about some of these civilians and their experiences. On November 17th, for example, Jane Beale, a famed diarist from Fredericksburg and a teacher, wrote that she watched with trembling hearts the long line of Yankees pouring over the Chatham Hills to take the same station they occupied last summer. They come in countless numbers and our hearts sank within us. Now as the armies are positioning themselves, the Federal Army here in Stafford Heights, the Confederate Army across the river, some civilians make the decision to flee. They leave, they go to Richmond, they go to Gordonsville, they go to Culpeper, they go uh, out into the countryside. Salem Church, just west of us, becomes a sanctuary for some of these civilians fleeing. Mamie Wells, who is another diarist in Fredericksburg, talks about that and says why her family decided to stay. Uh, quote, because one of our household being sick with typhoid fever. And so there are extenuating circumstances preventing some people from fleeing. The enslaved cannot flee if their enslavers do not flee as well. And this uneasy air prevails over Fredericksburg because nothing happens. Because those bridges are delayed, the Union Army cannot cross the river. And so they stay here. The Confederates stay in Fredericksburg. And some of the civilians who fled decide to come back, making the decision that battle is not likely. Mamie Wells talks about that and says some of the citizens had returned in the meantime, believing as we did, likewise, that after such a delay, it was not likely that the uh, intention of the enemy to molest us. Satisfied upon this point, we gradually unpacked our clothing and restored it to their place. And when we were asked the question, do you think the, sh the town will be shelled? We invariably answered, no. Jane Beale, who had fled to her brother's house, Brayhead, comes back and said, we have but few neighbors left and feel as if we had the entire town to ourselves. And then December 10th and 11th came. Late on December 10th, the Union engineers began to push those bridges, those pontoon boats, into the river and begin construction. The Confederate soldiers in Fredericksburg hear that construction and begin to make plans to fight and oppose the crossing. Lieutenant Colonel John Pfizer, the 17th Mississippi, wrote in his official report, 
Knowing that there were many families occupying the houses on the margin of the river, I, just, I deemed it proper to notify all of the women and children of their danger and give them time to get out from under the range of the enemy's guns. And so Confederate soldiers, Mississippians and Floridians went knocking on the doors of people who lived along the river, warning them that this was their last chance to get out. Some fled, some stayed. And then the battle begins. Fighting begins on this river below me as Confederate sharpshooters begin to pick off engineers preventing the crossing. Union cannon on this side of the river opened fire on the city of Fredericksburg. At the height of the bombardment, 100 shells a minute drop into the city of Fredericksburg. As buildings catch on fire, as smoke rolls above the skyline, the Union cannoneers use the church steeples behind me to use as their targets. And the shelling continues. Jane Beale wrote about the experience. The enemy began to pour their shot and shell upon our ill-fated town. Her son is wounded by some of the shrapnel and debris flying through the air. Mimi Wells, who lived on Sophia Street, continues, the flash of one cannon after another as they were arranged along the hills beyond, lighting up the scenery around and the deafening shouts that followed were sights and sounds which the novel spectator must have viewed and listened to with eager eyes and ears. It was a beautiful but awful sight. A man who lived on William Street, Edward Heineken, continues that description, talking about the, the shelling. We had hardly gotten up from breakfast when a big shell passed through the dining room, knocking off one leg of the table from which we had just risen. Thirteen shells struck that comparatively small house. From early in the morning until dusk raged the tremendous noise of battle. The roar of artillery, the roll of musketry, the fall of slate and chimneys, the crack of branches torn from many shade trees, the screaming of shells high up in the air. And still, the Wells family remained. Edward Heineken flees, Jane Beale flees, the Wells family stays in their basement, and Mamie Wells is the only known account uh, who stays in Fredericksburg the entire battle. And she says, beside her own family of ten, several poor outcasts sought shelter with us. Over the day, Union soldiers begin to cross the river. They row themselves across, and they fight house by house, block by block, clearing the city of Fredericksburg. With, with Fredericksburg and Union hands, Union soldiers take out their frustration. They have been pent up here on Stafford Heights for nearly a month, and they begin to loot the city. They trash homes that were unoccupied. The Wells home was largely left alone because of the fact that the Wells family remained. But she talks about this, Mimi Wells talks about this, and says, but that night, the pounding at our doors, the peering in the cellar's windows by eyes red with intoxication, the oaths and curses, the ringing of axes and hammers, breaking in the tenantless houses. The streets were literally packed with soldiers in a complete state of moral demoralization. It's important to realize at this point that we are, of course, quoting white accounts from largely Confederate supporting citizens their experiences are going to be different from Unionists or African Americans in the city of Fredericksburg. Our problem, of course, is we do not have accounts from those people. Uh, accounts from Unionists are lacking. Accounts from African Americans are lacking. Uh, we simply do not know what they thought about this battle or what, they, what their actions were to this battle. Uh, and so we're left with an incomplete picture, trying to fill in the blanks around the situation. And the battle continues. On December 13th, as Union soldiers famously attacked the stone wall at Maurice Heights, uh, and then come streaming back in defeat, Mimi Wells again is left to talk about it. And these, these days of action, these days of consequence, December 11th, 12th, 13th, 14th, and 15th, and she summarizes. First, the terrific bombardment, followed by the night of plunder. Second, the day of destruction and carnage, accompanied with shells from Confederates, and the night of raillery and carousing. Third, the day of the battle and the night in which the cries of the wounded rent the air in piteous groans. Fourth, the day in which the wounded were borne through the streets on litters and in ambulances, with the blood dripping from their mangled bodies, and another night in which the mind gathered no rest. By the time the Union Army retreats across the river back to here, back to Stafford Heights on December 15th, Mamie Wells is left to guess every fifth house had been occupied as a hospital, and there were many dead bodies to be found in these dwellings. 10% an estimated of the city is destroyed during the Battle of Fredericksburg. Houses along the river's edge were bombardment into dust and rubble. And yet for all of that, we know of only two civilians who were killed during the battle. 
Uh, one was a boy named Jacob Grotz who was killed in their shell fire, and another, Mary Price or Pryor, an enslaved woman who was killed in the bombardment on December 11th. Other accounts claim other civilians, but those are largely unsubstantiated. And so Fredericksburg, even though it was at the height of the bombardment and the height of the fighting, suffers two casualties. And so ends the first battle of Fredericksburg, and with it, the civilian experience of that battle. There are going to be more battles and more fighting and more carnage, and by the end of the war in 1865, Fredericksburg had dropped from an estimated population of 5,000 to 950. It's going to take years for the city of Fredericksburg to recover economically, demographically, uh, and scars of that fighting can still be found in some homes that have shell craters uh, and, and holes through their roof beams.